So I want to talk to you this morning about the power of love. Actually, it's the power of forgiveness, but I just said, let's put it love. The power of love. Everybody say, the power of love. So let's go to Matthew 5, 43, 44. It says, you have heard the law of Moses say, love your neighbor. Everybody say, love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. And hate your enemy. Right? That's what it says, right? Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. In the Old Testament. Not in the New Testament. So, Jesus is saying that in the Old Testament you heard, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. 44 says, but I say, woo, love your enemies. Whoa, Jesus, isn't that too hard? Yes. It looks hard on our flesh, but if you can really believe, we will receive. Amen. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. If you read this in the Passion Translation, Passion Translation is much better. Right? It says, Love your enemy. Bless the one who curses you. Do something wonderful for the one who hates you. Woo! Is it in the Bible? Pastor, I think you are reading the wrong Bible. It's in the Bible. Amen. Do something wonderful for the one who hates you. You Yes, and respond to the very one who persecutes you by praying for them. Notice, pray for those who persecute you. Let's see another verse then. Romans 13, 9, 10, it says, For the commandments against adultery and murder and stealing and coveting and any other commandment, talking about the Old Testament, right? Commandment that came through Moses. Okay, it's talking about that. They are all, and any other commandment are all summed up in this one commandment. What's that? Love your neighbor as yourself. And it goes on to explain, love does no wrong to anyone. So love satisfies all of God's requirement. That means when you walk in love, you don't have to walk, you don't have to be mindful of the Ten Commandments. That's what it says. When you walk in love, guess what? You are sufficing everything that has been said in the Ten Commandments. You don't have to be mindful of the Ten Commandments. You just have to be mindful of walking in love. And it says, love your neighbor as yourself. And so love does no wrong to anyone. It doesn't say, notice it doesn't say, love your circle of friends. Right? It doesn't say, love the Christians only. Christians can get more group there. You know, for example, right? Hmm, it doesn't say that. It says, it doesn't say, love the lovely. See, it's easier, easy to love the lovely ones, right? You need to know how to love the unlovely. Love is a verb. Action. Action. If you say, I love, that means you need to act. Love is a decision. It's not about, I love you, I love you, I love you. No, it's a decision. You need to act. And this kind of love, the act, the, the, the verb kind of love, never fails. Say amen. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 13, 8. It says, love never, what, what does it say? Uh huh. Love never. Right. Now listen to me. If love never fails, that means the love in you can never fail. The love, so you need to understand this. The love, see, God loves so much the world, right? That He gave, right? So God is love, right? Amen? Are you getting it? So, the love that never fails loves you with love that can never fail. Did you get it? The love that never fails loves you with a love that, never, that can never fail. And the Bible says, Romans 5.5 5 says, the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart. So you have the love. All right, let me do this too. Um, Galatians 5, 6. I want to, why love is so important, okay? You want to know? All right. Galatians 5, 6, it says, Faith working through love. 
That means fate works through love. Right? That means your fate is rendered useless without love. No love, that means your fate will not work. Uri Baba. That's what I'm saying. Faith, if faith is the engine, love is the fuel. You have faith as a believer, but that faith in you cannot work if you don't have love. So one translation says, the Passion translation says like this, faith is activated and brought into perfection by love. So the moment you act in love, your faith gets activated. And we believers are called to walk by faith. Amen. That means for a believer, for a Christian, faith is a lifestyle. It's not an option. And that means you as a believer is rendered useless if you don't have love. Kokla, ille, Japri You know what I mean? Shunni, ille. Amen. Alright, so that means if I preach, teach, do ministry without love, it will come to nothing. Are you getting what I'm saying? Even me. See, the Bible tells us that Jesus was moved with compassion. What is that? Compassion is love in action. Every time you see, you see him healing people, he was moved by compassion. He was moved by love. That's why people got healed. That's why there was miracles, signs and wonders. Because he was moved by love. His faith worked because of love. Amen. Let's see another verse, then I'll go to point number one. First John 3, 14, 15, it says, Anyone who does not love remains in death. 15 says, anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Oh my goodness. Hate. Anyone who hates is a murderer. That means hate can turn into murder. Right? Amen? Amen. So, there are red flags. I call it red flags. Okay? There is a path that we all go through. Okay, And we need to watch out for this. And so we'll talk about steps to having a, uh, to experience the power of love in your life. Okay, number one. So where does it all begin? Number one, hate precedes murder. According to this verse, hate precedes murder. That means hate goes before murder. Before you kill anyone, you have to have hate. Hate comes. It can be also, it can be said like, hate comes before death works. Before you do anything wrong, hate comes. Alright? Alright, let's talk about Joseph, Mr. Joseph. The Bible says his Joseph brother hate Joseph. Because his father loved him more than them. So, uh, they hated Joseph because he was a dad's pet. Or we would, we would say, that is boy. Okay? And then one day, Joseph had a dream. Remember the dream, right? And when, he, when they heard about the dream, it adds fuel to the fire. They, got, they began to hate him more because of the dream. The Bible says they grew to hate him. And they would not even speak to, them, to, to him. Think about this to that extent. Alright? Notice the hate. They began to hate Joseph, right? Everybody say, hate Joseph. Okay. Can you not notice that? All right. Let's, let's go to 18, verse 18. Genesis 37, 18. It says, They spotted Joseph at a distance. By the time he got to them, they cooked up a plot to kill him. Wow. They hated Joseph first. And guess, guess what? They came to a point where they were willing to kill Joseph. Who? Joseph. Hate, if you don't deal with it, can lead into murder. And that's what hate can do if you're not careful. 
The result of hate will lead to ambush, assault, and finally killing. Maybe you're thinking, nah, iman tok no But have you ever thought about killing someone? That's the question. That's the thing, right? Amen. See, if someone is killed by accident, then it is a different story. Are you getting what I'm saying? Amen. But we can see that here in Deuteronomy 19, it talks about this guy was actually hate, filled with hatred for his neighbor and he actually killed him. So, number two, what precedes hate? Number two, anger precedes hate. So anger comes before hate. I'm just giving you a foundational, okay, first. Then we'll talk about the real thing. Ah, anger comes before hate. And the first murder in the Bible, do you know that Cain and Abel, remember that? The first in the murder in the Bible was because of anger. Do you know that? Yeah, let's see. Genesis 4, 3, 4. I want you to see something here. It says, in the process of time, notice this line, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Verse 4 says, Abel also brought of the first fruit of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. Okay. <clears throat> it's talking about offering, right? I want you to notice something here. Uh, in the process of time, that means the time, when the time came for Cain to bring an offering, the Bible says he just brought an offering. Uh, what's wrong with that? Well, we'll see. On the other hand, Abel did not just brought an offering. What did he do? Look at here. He brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. That means, Abel brought the first and the best. That means he put God first. And he brought, gave God the best. Cain, on the other hand, he'll just, he just began to, he just brought an offering. That means, No one will eat that mango, so just give it to me. He just collected and he gave it. But Cain, uh, Abel, he made sure the lamb that he was able to offer was the right one. And he, the Bible's fat means healthy. He didn't give the skinny lamb. You know? <laughs> No. He gave the best one, the fat one. The best. This is actually talking about attitude of offering. Genesis 4 5 tells us God did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry. The message translation says like this Cain lost his temper and went into a salt and missing. His face. He began to show it in his face. Now, why did God reject Cain's offering? That's the next question. Why? It's not that God hated crops. Amen? It's not that God was against the vegetables. But it was the, about the way it was offered. It was about the heart in the offering. Your heart matters. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. It's not what you give, it's how you give that matters. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, let's go to 2 Corinthians 9.7. I want you to see something here. 2 Corinthians 9.7. Alright, this is so good. This is so good. I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over. Make up your own mind what you will give. Wow. Don't just give. That's what the Bible says. Don't just give. Take plenty of time and think it over. That means you must decide from your home what to give, how much to give. Not just come, you know, come to church. I don't know, la, la. No, you must each decide how much to give, how to give, what to give. Amen. Anger is an emotion. The Bible says, 
In Ephesians 4, 26, 27, be angry and do not sin. It's in the Bible. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on the rat. So you can get angry and not sin. Amen. And it says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. That means don't stay angry. More like chicken fried rice, <laughs> Don't stay angry. If you stay angry, what does the verse 27 says? You give place to the devil. Oh. It's not that anger is a sin. It's what you do with the anger that leads to sin. Amen. Hallelujah. Something should make you angry. If you see an injustice, it should make you angry. Yeah. You shouldn't be like, Oh, it's okay. Oh, it's okay. No, you should get angry if injustice is done. Something should make you angry. When someone is not being treated right, it should make you angry. That anger can be used in a good way. Jesus was angry too. At the church, he was at a church and he saw all those people doing business in the church. You know what he did? He turned the table and then he took a whip. That's what the Bible says. Whip! Yeah, so what comes before anger then? Number three, offenses. offenses. Offenses comes before anger. The Bible says Cain was offended at God and at Abel. Because God favored Abel. That's why he was angry at Abel. <laughs> Amen. That's why he committed you know, the sin of killing his brother. Hallelujah. The Bible says in Matthew 24, 10, it says, Many will be offended. Many. It says right here, many will be offended. Will betray one another, will hate one another. Hallelujah. When Jesus was on this earth, not many appreciate Jesus. Do you know that? Yeah. They didn't like him. Not everyone will like you. <laughs> Sorry. Let me be the first one to tell you. But uh, uh, yeah, sorry to burst your bubbles, but there will be people who doesn't like you. Amen, Jesus. No one. I mean, like there were people who didn't like he. They wanted to kill him. And then let's see a verse. Mark six two three says, "When the Sabbath they come, so he was during the Sabbath, and he was preaching in the synagogue. He was teaching, and listen to this word. Many hearing him were astonished." Everybody say astonish. And I'll give, it exam I'll give it a meaning of astonish, okay? Why were they astonished? And the Bible says, and the Bible says, uh, uh, and saying, where did this man get this thing? And what wisdom is this which was given to him which, and that such mighty works were performed by his hand? And verse 3 says, they were offended at Jesus. Everybody say offended. So they were astonished and they were offended, right? Why were they astonished? Because of the words? Because of the wisdom that was flowing out of him? Because of the mighty work that was being done? Why were they astonished? Because he was an ordinary man. They saw an imperfect vessel. Jesus what? This kind of stuff. Yeah. Ordinary Jesus. So when he went up and he spoke with such mighty acts and with anointing, they could not take it. They were offended. The word astonished, listen, in Greek it means to strike. That's what it means, astonish. To hit someone, to strike someone. So listen, the people were astonished. What does it mean? It means as Jesus spoke the word, it was like the people were getting slapped. The word that came out from Jesus was like a slap. That's why they could not take it. Open this. 
Now, I want to come to number four. Unfulfilled expectation. Unfulfilled expectations precedes offenses. Unfulfilled expectation precedes offenses. Unfulfilled expectation comes before offenses. Now the Bible says in Luke 7, 18, 19, it talks about John. The disciples of John came to John and told John concerning all the things that Jesus has, was doing. And John, listen, it says in verse 19, he called to his disciples and then he called them and then said, go to Jesus and ask him, are you the coming one? Are you the coming one or do we look for another? Hello, think about this. John the Baptist, John the cousin of Jesus, John who actually baptized Jesus, John who said that he is the coming, he, he is the he is the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. This same guy now doubted Jesus. Same guy. The same John. He was a cousin of Jesus, right? The same John who was who was uh, filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. Think about that. The same John now doubted Jesus. Are you the are, are you the coming one? Do or do we wait for another? What made him think, what made John doubt of Jesus? Next the question, right? Unfulfilled expectation. I mean, how can you say unfulfilled expectation? Well, he expected Jesus to visit him in the jail. Think about this. He was in the town and he was doing his crusade and he, Jesus did not visit him. That's why he said, come on Jesus, we're a cousin bro. So what happens is, this, you, you need to understand this. When you look up to someone and then you, you, don't file, you don't find your expectation from that person, guess what will happen? Offenses. For example, we, have the, we usually have this uh, love feast, okay? The warehouse church love feast. Suppose you make a, for the love feast, you made a dish, right? You made a dish and then in the love feast, everyone brings their own dish. Okay, and then we line it up. <laughs> we line it up, we get ready, okay? We line it up and so, you know, everyone gets excited and, I mean, the warehouse church really know how to eat during the love feast, okay? So, everyone line up and then, Guess what? Your dish wasn't touched. <laughs> no one touched your dish. And no one said anything about your dish. Now you're offended. Where are church in In life, let me say this. With people, listen to me. Expect nothing. Appreciate everything. Amen. Now we're coming back to the... I've been building you up so that I can get to you about love. What comes before love? What comes before love? What comes before you can actually walk in love? Are you ready? Forgiveness. Forgiveness precedes love. Now, let's go back to Matthew 5, 43, 44. All this time, I've, tried, I've been trying to build you up to come to this point. Because this is very important. Love your, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies, bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Now, how can you love someone that hates you? Let me ask you this question again. How can you love someone that hates you? How? How can you love your enemy? It's so easy, right? Love your enemy. Quadrupsi is easy as well. Right? Hey, brother, sister, we can. Love your enemy. Love them. It's easy to say it, but how? That's the thing. 
Forgive. Forgive. Simple. Forgive. Forgiveness leads to love. Let me give you a story, an example from the Bible. Jacob and Esau. Remember that? Yeah, remember Jacob and Esau? Jacob stole the birthright and the blessings from Esau. Esau was the elder brother and a hairy guy. All right? And he was supposed to get the blessings, but guess what? Jacob stole it. And the Bible says in Genesis 27, 41, it says, Esau said in his heart, listen, this is the last line. He said, the day of my mourning for my father is at hand. That means after my father died, after my father dies, I will kill my brother Jacob. That's what he said. It's in the Bible. That means he hated Jacob, right? So Esau hated Jacob because of what he did. Hate leads to murder, right? Remember? Okay. Now, watch. It's been 20 years. That they will meet after 20 years. Okay, let's go to Genesis 31. Verse Genesis 31. It says, Jacob lifted up his eyes, and they're about to meet. Esau and Jacob is about to meet. Alright? Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked. And there Esau was coming, and there were 400 men. So Esau <laughs> came with 400 men to meet Jacob. Now, what would you think? How would you react if you see 400 men? The one who hates you comes with 400 men. Kinya like you. You know, all those going, you know, tough guys. They're coming at you. What would you do? The Bible says he, you know, he took his sons and gave them a hug and then, you know, he gave them to his wife. That's what the Bible says. He just gave them to his wife and then said, stay here. I'll go and meet my brother. And this is what happened. Verse 4. So beautiful. Verse 4 says, Esau ran to meet him, embraced him, fell on his neck and kissed him. And they wept. Wow. How does Esau get from hating him to, I mean, he wanted to murder him into loving him, embracing him, kissing him. Think about this. How? Because he forgave. Easy. That's the only way. That's the only way you need to forgive. Now, the next question is, how do I forgive? Remember I said this, love is not a feeling. It's a decision. You don't forgive someone because you feel, oh, I, I, I forgive, and then you forgive. No, it's, it's not a feeling. It's more than a feeling. It's a decision. Hallelujah. Forgiveness is giving grace. Write it down. It's giving grace. Forgiveness is giving grace. So how do you give grace? In order to give grace, you have to receive grace. If you don't have it, you can't give it. See, if you have a problem giving forgiveness, you have a problem receiving forgiveness. Matthew 10, 8 says, Freely you have received, freely you should give. Freely. And grace means free. Grace is what God has done. And gave it to you free. He gave it to you free. Hallelujah. Freely. So if you, could, if you don't receive grace, guess what? You will not be able to give grace. And you can't give what you don't have. If you don't have money, you can't help someone with money. Right? Amen. You can't give freely what you haven't received freely. That's why in a relationship, in a marriage, there has to be lots of forgiveness. Lots of forgiveness. Lots of saying, I'm sorry. 
Let me say this, if you feel like you have to earn forgiveness from God, you will also make other people earn forgiveness from you. That's where the grace of God comes in. Amen. <laughs> and once you understand grace, I'm telling you, once you understand grace, you will forgive others easily. Because you, are, you know that you have been forgiven easily. Ah, no one is right. You're, you're not perfect. Neither am I. I didn't earn grace. I received grace. It was given to me freely. You need to, as a couple, need to show each other grace. Hallelujah. Now, the word forgive. You know what it means in Greek? It's one word. The word forgive. It means release. Simple. Forgive means release. Wow. Such a wonderful word, right? When you forgive them, you're releasing them. When God forgave you, He released you from the punishment of sin. Yeah. When God said, I forgive you, that means He's releasing you. So when I say, I forgive you, sister, that means I'm releasing you. Releasing you of what you have done. God released us from judgment. Amen. So, when you truly forgive someone, it means you have released them. 